the journey begins today. Hi, thank you so much for clicking on the video in which I am going to start documenting the progress or the lack thereof as to how I'm going to go about trying to save an orchid that has a terminal spike, which, <laughs> the key word being terminal, also referring to the fact that the Phalaenopsis is done. The growing point is no longer active, usually signaling that this Phalaenopsis is terminal, aka not inclined to live beyond what it is doing now, blooming its head off. So that all sounded a bit radical, but in my experience I have never managed to get a Phalaenopsis with a terminal spike to grow a keiki or a basil plant which would ensure its survival. It could be the natural response of the orchid to do that because surviving is ingrained in its DNA. However, that normally occurs via pollination, seed pod, etc. In the case of my orchid, I am not going to be pollinating a seed pod in the hopes that I can, 10 years from now, see her blooms again. Instead, my intervention is going to be different and I will be documenting the measures I plan to take as and when I do them so that we can follow the journey of success or failure. Before I do that though, I want to give a shout out to Brea Fisher who stopped me in my tracks with her comment, stating that I should not cut off the spikes as I had mentioned in the introduction of insolence video. In that video, I stated I was going to cut off the spikes so that the orchid does not drain all the energy she has into the blooming, leaving little to nothing left for her for what I need her to do to survive. I should have been more specific in that video because I was not going to cut off the terminal spike seeing as it is the strongest and a keiki would be more likely to come from that area. However, Freya Fisher's comment gave me room for pause because she quite rightly stated that a keiki can grow from any spike and I have five of those. So before we get into how I'm going to go about dealing with this orchid, first of all let's clear all the media around the base of the orchid so that we can get some air and light into the area and more importantly avoid any potential for rot to happen during the current adverse conditions which I will explain in more detail in a minute. While I fiddle with this, please help the channel out by giving this video a like and subscribe if you have not already done so. It really does help get the word out that I exist on YouTube. The share button is also there for you to abuse and use and share the video out to anyone and every group of people you may know that might be interested in following along with Insolence's journey. Thank you so much in advance. It is alarming how the orchids in the mass-producing nurseries are shoved into a pot along a conveyor belt using two hands cupped full of media. The pots are filled to almost the top, resulting in media being too high around the stem. This can pose all sorts of issues even before the orchid has arrived in the collection. Not necessarily in a dry climate with plenty of airflow and nice warm temperatures, but just during the transportation itself different climate influences throughout the journey from A to B to C, and seeing as warm and dry with plenty of airflow are not my current conditions, quite the opposite as a matter of fact, removing as much media from around the stem is my best practice. This is what we do not want to perpetuate itself at the bottom of the pot. Now, at this point in time, I cannot say if I've already got stem rot, but it's a sure sign that it's far too wet. You can see how low this orchid is in the pot. And there is a leaf down here that is already yellow at the base. And oh my goodness, it's just coming out super easy. Oh dear, I do not like the translucent look right here at the edge of the leaf. Oh, this is bad. Not good news, not good news. Let's hope it's just because it's too deep in the pot and that it hasn't gotten to the stem. I'm going to continue. I'm right by the tissue of the seedling plug. I'm gonna cut this root off here because it is dead and it could pose a decay problem that we do not want. So 
So it started to rain, but I continued diligently on with my business undercover. Now that it stopped, I'm going to show you everything I got out of the surface. I went down to the seedling sponge, cleared the space all around the base and the stem of the orchid. I can't see anything except, uh, yeah, yucky looking roots. But this has me concerned. At least we've seen it, so we can keep an eye on that stem. Now, I'm glad that's done. <laughs> We're ready for the next step. Finally, I get to give her a welcome cocktail of 100 parts per million of CalMag and 60 parts per million of seaweed at 7 pH. And I say finally because I've had this orchid for a good part of 10 days now and she has not had any water since her arrival. The pot was good and wet when she arrived and seeing that I wanted to film her journey, it was best to let the media dry out to some degree before giving her the CalMag and seaweed. So, I am going higher in my CalMag concentration this time around because the roots of this orchid are in a terrible state, the light she requires to photosynthesize is non-existent, the temperature preference of anything above 18 degrees Celsius is not reality in my grow space, it is lower and will be for the foreseeable future, as in my current temperature high will only go to 16 degrees Celsius. Calcium will help with keeping the strength in her structures and the magnesium will help with the photosynthesis of the reduced light that she is currently exposed to. And I'm not filling the soak up to the rim of her pot only halfway because we need that area around the stem to stay nice and dry. The doses of my CalMag and seaweed are contrary to what I would normally do during the growing conditions I've just mentioned. I'm also adding seaweed in this mix because of the growth hormones that seaweed has. Even though the conditions are not ideal, I am banking on the hormones of the seaweed to get into the orchid well ahead of time before temperatures rise again so that when they do rise my guesstimate is that there should be a nice concentration of hormones gathering somewhere ready to produce a plantlet or a cakey and having added to the gaggle of hormones early i am hoping that this will increase my chances of encouraging that additional growth Normally, I do not add any growth hormones to my orchids while they are dealing with adverse conditions, but in this case, I hope to get ahead of the game and see what happens. If you're thinking cakey paste, I have tried that in the past before I had my channel, and it did not work for me either. Maybe I got a bad batch of cakey paste, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to purchase any more. Just keeping fingers crossed that administering seaweed will work in my favor. My last step is to cut off all the blooms, just below the first bloom of the spike, leaving all the nodes of all the spikes in place. I contemplated plucking the blooms off and not cutting the spike, but I did not want the orchid to think that she can extend the spikes and continue blooming from that point on. That is not the point of the exercise for her to extend her blooming period, so to avoid that from happening, I am targeting the cut just below the first bloom of each spike, in the hopes that the whole spike doesn't get absorbed straight away and to avoid any pathogens from entering into the cut, I'm going to apply some cinnamon to each of the cuts. This is something I do not do as a rule every time I cut a spike, but taking the conditions into consideration, things not drying out as quickly as they would if the temperatures were warmer, cinnamon it is. For the coming months, I will be fertilizing, flushing, and supplementing this orchid as if the temperatures were ideal. Having applied seaweed, that needs to be backed up with fertilizer in case she activates a keiki or a plantlet. Then the nutrients need to be ready and available so that she does not absorb all the energy that she has in the leaves. We need those and cannot afford to lose them. Repotting at this stage is not an option, not just because I do not have any active roots, but to reduce any form of stress. She is stressed as it is. She's got bud blast. That's normal to be expected but she is worse off stressed because of the state of her root system in the pot. Now, my fertilizer concentration will be 300 parts per million regardless, which is what all my large phalaenopsis get. At a pH of 7, the same pH will apply when supplementing with CalMag and seaweed. It'll stay at the higher end of 100 parts per million for the CalMag and 60 parts per million of seaweed. And based on when temperatures rise and light influences increase, I may up the seaweed 
to 100 or 120 parts per million just to keep the momentum going. Should anything happen in the coming weeks that is worth documenting, I will have her back in the viewfinder and tell you all about it. For now, we wait. Thank you so much for watching. Your time is appreciated. If you watch this video to the end, thank you for that extra special support. Wishing you a wonderful day on one condition, though, that you do stay safe. Take care. Bye.